In this video, we're going to talk about doing testing inside of Unity, in particular unit testing with NUnit. So I'd first like to start by looking at an article that I wrote uh, quite some time ago and talked about the challenges of doing unit testing inside of the tool. So first I gave a review of unit testing itself, um, what it is, then at the time Unity had, uh, Unity Technologies had published uh, some information about how they were using unit testing internally to uh, go over their own code base and to help with their QA process and increase stability. And so there's some information about that. I talk a little bit about what's called test-driven development, which we'll look at in the video here. Um, then an uh, example of what a unit test is. Essentially, you've got some bit of functionality and you're going to do a test on it to see that the value you think that is sh should come out of that functionality is indeed um, there. So uh, if it's not, then you're able to know right away. You build these tests over the course of a large project and automate the way that the testing happens and overall increases the stability and the confidence that you have in your coding. Uh, there's always been some challenges with unit testing. There's some asset store projects that have been out for years. I talk about them in this article. But some of the challenges are Unity engine specific code, such as mono behavior, causes difficulties in your uh, unit testing and your, your larger testing, not just in the unit testing. So uh, the recently, in December 18th, Unity announced that they have their own official way for you to do unit testing and more. So uh, the article in which this video that you're listening to is embedded uh, will talk about what is a unit test, what is an integration test, and what is an assertion component, and how that helps you with your own testing and debugging, rather. Um, the package is free. As you can see here, this icon shows where you can find that, and the article that you're in uh, lists that. So I'm only going to talk about unit testing in this example. Um, you can download this for free. Um, the package that Unity provides, see examples of all three of these. Um, but I found it a bit overwhelming to jump in and look at their documentation, so I just wanted to come up with a quick video here. So let's just jump in. I'm going to open up Unity, and we're going to look at a project that I created called the Unit Unity Test Tools Demo. And the first thing I'm going to do is just make the screen a little bit more friendly for me. So in um, the demo, there's really not much going on. I've got an empty game object on the screen. I've got a script over here attached to it and then um, some classes I'm reusing from my larger video series, Unity with Cocktails. I've got a beer, beverage, and soda class, and we'll just do a little bit of iteration on top of them for a bit. So first, to, to make the screen a little bit more friendly, let's see, I'm going to set up something similar to what Unity recommends for this, but be a little bit different. I'm going to move this here. And then I'm going to open up Unity Testing Tools, and they've got several windows, but I only want the Unit Test Runner, since that's all I'm going to be doing. You can already see we've got some, some stuff there to talk about. We've got middle panel showing some info already. And then I'm going to save this layout, and I'll call it Unit Test the unit testing. Uh, okay, so let me go ahead, oh, let me get the console out and make that available for us as well. I'll save over that window. Okay, so now we've got a window that we can always refer to whenever we're in our project. We can use any of the windows we're familiar with, um, any of the layouts rather, and then when we want the layout specific to the testing, we'll jump down to that one that I've created. Now, the first thing we'll do is just give the give the project a run. Okay, so I do that. There's never going to be anything to look at really in the scene itself, um, but we see a little bit of information trace out. So let's just find out how we got to that. Well, I've got one empty game object that's in the scene, and um, inside that I've got one component, and the component's just going to do some tracing out of some information, which is we've got in the console. So let me open up MonoDevelop and catch us up to speed with that. So as a starting point, 
the code we're about to look at, that simulates your actual application, not the testing, but this is the environment. Okay, we just have a simple mono develop, um, mono, sorry, we have a mono behavior opening up in mono develop, and inside the start, I call run demo, and inside run demo, I do nothing very exciting. I've got a couple custom classes, beer and a soda, and I just trace out or debug log out a little bit of information. So let's call this world here your actual game, your actual application code. It could be many, many classes, but the idea is this is where you're actually adding functionality and you're doing your work. The testing will be somewhere else. So what I've chosen to do, and I'm using namespaces and some folder structure here, but that's not required. So when we look at my project window, uh, to do unit testing, you don't need this level of structure, but inside my scripts folder, I've got an editor folder and a sibling regular folder. So if I hold there, you can see here they are here. Now, it is a requirement that your testing, uh, your end unit testing classes go inside of an editor folder. And I haven't read exactly about why that is, but I believe it's that you don't want these testing classes to make it into your end build. There's no reason for that. It's only for the development environment. And then once you push it out to your end device, those classes don't need to exist in there. So by having them in the editor folder, like all editor classes that have existed beforehand, uh, that doesn't get pushed into the end. Um, there also might be some reasons of why um, the editor classes need to be in there, but I'm not sure. Um, so that's my code. We'll go in scripts. Then up here in Unity testing tools, this is the package you get from uh, Unity, and that includes all of their code that makes this testing work, and that's the integration test, that component tester, whatever they called it, and then also the unit testing. We're, we're only talking about Unity testing here, unit testing here. Uh, so what I've done is I have a com, rmc, projects, utt demo folder structure using reverse domain naming. And then inside the uh, regular, I've got the same, com, blah, 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 blah. And this is a, a standard way to set up your unit testing. If you've got 100 classes spread over 30 packages, you'd have a large um, regular set of folders there. And then you'd mimic it in the uh, editor folder to have your testing. And what's nice about that is that you can have your, um, it's easy to find. If I'm testing something here like UTT demo beer and I want to find the test, it's in UTT demo beer test. Everything is very consistently named and positioned. Um, I think another historic reason for having the parallel structure between editor and regular is if you wanted to test internal packaging, so if you had an internal, which is a keyword within the C-sharp language, an internal feature, internal respects packages, and it says only internal to this package can you access this or that. Um, you might not always be taking advantage of that, but that's part of the reason that this structure is. So again, you don't have to do this parallel structure, but you do need your testing classes in editor, and you do need all your other code outside of editor. So that's the, the bare bones limitation there. Uh, so let's take a look again. Um, we were here looking at our code. So um, now what we might do for testing if we've never used unit testing before is we just do things like this. We're always tracing things out and making sure values are the same. Um, you might even be throwing exceptions. You know, if, um, if beer calories doesn't equal 200, you know, then throw some exception, right? And then that's going to stop your execution. And that's, that's a way to do your testing, right? But th what we want to do here is instead of uh, muddling our code with testing materials, we want to keep that separate. So that's why we've set up those parallel structures, and that's why we're able to do the testing that we talked about. So let's say, let's say we wanted to test this. Well, I've already got some testing done. So let's take a look at the beer class itself. Um, oh, sorry. Not find references, but go to declaration. Okay, so inside the beer class, we've got a calories property. We've got lots of other stuff. This was used in my earlier series um, uh, to talk about public and private and methods and uh, properties and etc. So there's a little bit more than we need for this demo, but it's quite useful, and you can 
build onto it. So beer extends from the beverage class. The beverage class doesn't give too much. And then um, you've got uh, when you set the constructor, you pass in a name like Budweiser, and then you give it a container type. Just like, is it in a bottle or is it in a can? And that's pretty much it. And it's just for academic use. You know? So what I'm doing here is I'm tracing up beer calories, which I think is 200. Uh, and that's it. So now let's take a look at how testing might help us with that. Well, if we jump back into the tool, you can see, oh, wow, we've got a bunch of tests here. Now, how did we administer them? Well, look, where did, where did all that stuff come from? Um, when you open up the Unity test tools package from Unity, it's a bit daunting because there's all this stuff that's already out there on the screen. Um, you know, where does it come from? Well, let's take a look. Inside the UTT demo, let me kind of show parallel here. So we've got beer test and soda test, and they're inside of a nice uh, collapsible package specific uh, line item there. So com, RMC, projects, UTT demo. So in a larger project, you might have many, much code and a lot of different packages. And so this display quite nicely shows it by package. And then you can expand out and see by test. Some of the tests even tree out. I'll show you why that is. Um, but here you go, we've got beer test, which has got some stuff in it, and we've got soda test, which I think just has one test. Uh, the way that that gets plugged into the interface is just by it very existing inside any editor pack, any editor folder anywhere in your project, it's going to show up there if it meets certain criteria. So let's take a look at beer test here, for example. So beer test doesn't need to extend anything. But you can see that the imports here, uh, then unit are shown, and there's the beer test, then there's these test uh, attributes. So let's just do an experiment and comment out the tests before we even take a look at them. So the class is still viable, it still exists here, it's still in the editor, but we just took out the tests. And if we go back here and I think save, yeah, it disappears from the uh, unit tests runner. And what that means to me is that, that this panel, every time you do a save, it's going to look through all editor win folders in your project, and it's going to say, does any of them have this test um, attribute on them? So let me back up. So of course we do want them. All right, so the way you'd organize your tests, what unit tests are, what, how you test them, how you, that folds into your workflow, there's tons of material out there. It's way over my head you know I have a certain familiarity that helps me be able to contribute to teams but it's there's tons of stuff in there about what you want to set up and get automated testing and things like that going on um, so what I'm just here showing is just the syntax and kind of how to understand what unity gave you so we'll take a look at a few examples let's say for example we have a container type and we want to be able to test what that is so inside each test I'm going to create an instance of the class we're testing and do the test. And then at the end of that method, it dies, and then the test runner moves on to the next one and tests the calories. But here's what's basically happening. In each case, you're going to do a setup, which is going to be, in this case, create an instance. And then there's going to be an assertion. Assertion is, I believe that the, this result should be this. And if it's not, tell me about it. So I think that if I set the constructor to contain type bottle, then I should expect that that value of container type should be type bottle. And you'd think it would be if you set your constructor properly and it's setting that internal container type property correctly. Um, but you know, as we develop, we make all sorts of mistakes and the idea here is to be able to catch them as early as possible. So that's actually going to pass, but let's say that it didn't. Let's say uh, I wanted to say, okay, I set it to bottle, but then I'm going to assume that the value is can. Okay, so let's just give that a run, and we're going to expect that to fail. Um, so we'll come back here, give the project a run, and then what we do to run is uh, there's a couple ways to do it, but let's just say run all tests. We just click that once, and you're just going to think for a second, and then it's going to run down here. And for each of these, it's going to give us a bit of information. So you can see green means it passed. All these green ones, including soda, so does 100% pass. But the beer container type uh, test has failed. And down here it tells us that it was expected to be type can, but it was actually type bottle. 
right? Now we know that it should be bottled, but I'm just showing you an example. Um, all right, so let's just go back and reverse that. And then come back and we run our tests again. And now it passed, okay? So I'm taking some existing tests and kind of breaking them, I'm working a little bit backwards just to show you the functionality of the UI. Let's continue to look at the UI. So here's all the things that you can do with the unit test runner. We can have it so that every time I compile my project, so I'm kind of in work mode, having this sitting off to the side and just reminding me anytime that there's any errors thrown. So let's say I've got a larger project and I have 100 classes and I have 300 tests and everything's working well and I only want to find out if anything fails. Well, I can use some of these flags here to show me just what fails and I can say run on uh, runs on compile and then every time I run the project it's going to go ahead and run um, all the testing and then I'll go ahead and have that fail again and run the project again and then boom oh I noticed something popped up here right uh, there's a failure so somewhere in the project I was working I was changing some code some core logic and then I'm just compiling and playing the game like I normally would but boom this tells me right away that something has failed right so let's go ahead and fix that and then I'll show you what one more feature so the examples that come um, I have a template test full which is commented out so it doesn't and show up in the UI but this is the example that they give you as you can see you can test how long something takes you can tell to make sure something passes and make sure something fails you can have it uh, run a code passing in values one two three four five you can have it pass a range so let's say you want to test a, um, an addition um, functionality and you want to have a test uh, add 1 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 3 plus 3, 4 plus 4. You don't have to run an individual test for every combination. You can use some of this um, material to help you out there. And so you can look at the documentation to see those more robustly, but it's not just the assert equals as I shown. They, they've got some more stuff. So I've got a few different tests in here, testing some of those, but not all. Um, all right, so now let's take a look at what test-driven development is as a last paradigm, just so you could see how this might work into your um, workflow. So let's say we want to add a new piece of functionality and rather than creating our entire game and then adding tests on the last day and running those tests, which is not as useful, uh, what you'd want to do is do your testing as you go so that those failed tests that pop up on the side and surprise you, oh, whoa, you know, I, I've done something wrong. Well, let's look at how test-driven development might work in a very, very lean way. Uh, so let's say we want to make a new method, and it's going to be called uh, get my name. So I'm going to say beer get my name, and then I'm going to run that, and it'll say, oh, that doesn't exist already. So then I can use the refactor to create the method. And I'll decide where that should live. I'll put it in the public section. Or well, for the purpose of the demo, it doesn't much matter. So I'll just throw it there. Um, we want it to return a string, right? And the idea of test-driven development is that you do the test first. So here we've added the piece of functionality. It's got. So let's take a look at what happens now. We've got that function set up. We'll jump back in. And the first thing we want to do is make a test around that. So we'll go to our beer test. And I'm just going to create a section for new tests just because I want to clean them up in the next step. So I'll copy an existing test down. And the first thing we will do is we can count on the name. Get my name is our new function. And we'd expect it to be Pilsner. <clears throat> right, so let's have that pass. We give it a name of Pilsner. We get my name. Now we haven't done the implementation yet. So of course when we go into the application here, we're getting an error already. 
in, oh, I didn't give it any name. Test get my name. <clears throat> give that a run. And we say, oh, it fails. Why does it fail? Okay, the feature is not implemented yet. Well, of course. And <clears throat> then you'd come in and do the minimal amount you can get for it to move ahead. Run it again. Okay. Oh, expected something, blah, 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 blah. All right. So then we have to make it actually return the name. And go ahead. Bloop. Now it's done. Now, in test-driven development, the general idea is you create the bare amount of functionality you need, then you create the test to test that. Then you create just enough functionality to get the error to um, go away, just enough to make the test successful. You work in that way so you're making no assumptions about your code. If you create a test after the fact, it serves you less purpose because the earlier we can get that successful test in the production, then it's going to be paying those benefits as we talked about before. You do the compilation cycle and we're able to see those errors getting caught early on. Uh, so that's it. That's everything we've uh, wanted to cover here. We took a look at downloading, uh, where you can get the package to download from, the asset store, um, and then we took a look at how to use everything within the test runner. Um, last thing about these buttons here, so when you want it to run on compile, we have that option. If you want to run the test in a new scene, you'll see what happens when I run that. It actually is going to be generating them in a new scene. Because we're doing a non-graphical test here, it's not that important, but I think there might be a reason in your project you might want to do that. Uh, then because we want to see the testing results down here at the bottom, we keep show details below tests. Um, and then we want to notify me if the test is slow. I'm not actually sure what that is. Um, I haven't looked at the documentation about that, but some of the supplied tests that you see that come with the package have some timing attributed to them. For instance, um, return, this must return within three seconds. Perhaps it's that, or perhaps it's something that's uh, when your code is uh, has an error in an infinite loop or something. I'm not sure. Uh, so that's it for us today.